Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Hello, my friends and fellow achievers. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Have you had a great week? I sure hope so. Today, I want to introduce you to an inspiring new leader as I welcome Dr. Sharon Spano to the show. Sharon has a PhD in human and organizational systems. She is an author, a corporate business strategist, a workforce expert, and a professional speaker. Her mission is to empower business leaders and entrepreneurs to maximize performance, improve employee engagement, and increase bottom line results. We all want bottom line results, right? We all want results. Her new book is The Pursuit of Time and Money, Step into Radical Abundance, and Discover the Secret to a Meaningful, Prosperous Life. We'll be diving into that today. Sharon, it's so great to have you with us. How are you? I am awesome, Jake, and thank you so much for that great introduction and for having me on board today. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, it's great to have you. You know, on the Modern Leadership Podcast, we strive to find experts in their field, authors and other experts, leading voices that can come on and talk to us about some of these principles and these concepts that we may not have a very rich understanding about. And I got to tell you, as I read the title of your book, and I've got a copy of it, and I've read through some of it, I'm very excited to jump in and talk about this pursuit of time and money. It comes up so often in our lives. But before we do that, is there anything that we missed in the, in the intro? Anything about your personal life you care to share? Um, well, personal, uh, you know, I love to travel as, as do you. And uh, I guess the other element is I'm also a certified professional integral coach, which is a completely different kind of coaching that focuses more on personal transformation and really shifting consciousness. And that's just, I mean, it's my personal and professional uh, passion, I guess I want to say, but also travel. And of course, I've been married forever to a wonderful man. And uh, we just have a great life together. And I'm very, very blessed to have such a wonderful friend, partner and and husband. So that's a big part of of my my experience of life is just sharing it with him. Yeah. And as you were talking through that, I had to ask you, what is this integral coaching? I haven't heard of this. It's based on uh, something called integral theory, and it's very tied into my work in human development. And it's very complex, a little difficult to, to share in a few moments. But basically, we're looking at a far more holistic approach to life. We look at the internal, external, individual and collective experience of life. And it comes out of the work of a renowned philosopher uh, named Kim, Ken Wilbur, who's done extensive research over, I think, gosh, 30, 40 years now. So there's a whole community around integral consciousness. And then the integral coaching methodology, uh, I was blessed to, to be able to access that through integral uh, coaching Canada. Um, and um, that is, is bringing the theory, if you will, to real life application. So we have a very specific way that we engage with our clients and, and the coaching is probably the most profound I've ever seen. I'm, I'm not one that really enjoyed coaching before because it wasn't, uh, in my experience, doing the level of transformational work that I know is possible in human development. And that's really what we're doing is we're looking at developmental objectives and helping the client literally engage in what we call developmental movement. There, there are uh, 12 stages that we know of in human development. Um, 60% of the American public is in the uh, what we call expert or achiever stage. And, and that's, those are great places to be, obviously. We wouldn't all be as, as successful as we are. But there's other stages beyond that that allow for a richer, more robust experience of life. And so that's part of the work that I want to be about with my clients. And I often get executives who come to me who are stuck or frustrated or you know whatever's going on with them and they don't know why. So this approach allows us to go deep into the subconscious and really discover what it is they want out of life and then help them, uh, you know, move either horizontally, as we say, or vertically into a new experience of life. Very, very rewarding work on both ends of the spectrum. And uh, I just feel honored to, to have, a, have that as one of the, the elements in my toolbox of uh, helping people maximize their, their potential. And it sounds very exciting, and it's very interesting to look at this as more holistic view. And I think that as a society, as a culture, we're starting to look more and more into 
this whole life focus. We are whole individuals, whole beings. All the experiences that we've had in life have prepared us, have built the foundation for who we are today. And that is unleashing our potential for tomorrow. And taking a look at all these factors and all these things that play into that, I think is so fascinating. I wanted to ask you about coaching success. And have you found that as you work with these clients, as you're coaching, that coaching success is mostly dependent upon the willingness of the person being coached to follow through, to do what they're they're trying to do, to take the steps, take the action, than it is so much on exactly what we're teaching. And, And I say this from a coaching perspective as a coach myself. Yes, I mean, absolutely. I think what, what what's a little bit different about this approach is it's not me standing there so much as an accountability partner and we're, we're trying to accomplish goals, although that does happen. Um, it's more about uh, a container, if you will, that allows the person to see their current way of being. And together we define what a new way of being would look like. And we and, and then we I develop my role is to to I do like a six hour analysis where I'm looking at the client through several different lenses, uh, six or seven to be exact, depending on the client. Um, And so there's an intense analysis. And then I develop a program. We have developmental objectives that we're moving towards. But the key, Jake, that I think you'd find interesting is within the stages that we know of the 12, there are also 26 lines of development and they're very complex. And uh, we focus on six of them. And so within that context, I'm developing custom design practices for the client that allow them to experience their growth in those lines of development as well as the stages. So it's very powerful because it's less about me pushing, more about them experiencing. So if I do get any push-pull, it's often around they, 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 they may not, uh, because they're so busy, they may not do the practice that I've designed as, as rigorously as they might. But that's that's an indication of where they're stuck. So then we we work through that. And and what I love about the practices, I mean, if you think about it, I know you you you're a golfer. Uh, my husband's a golfer. I mean, you practice. I used to ride horses competitively. You practice anything in life uh, that you want to excel in. You have a practice around that, whether it's a spiritual practice or physical practice or, or whatever. So we're literally designing things that are custom. Uh, designed in alignment with their developmental movement goals. And so they begin to experience themselves in this new way of being. And once they see that, the shift is dramatic and often quite uh, rapid. They have a, literally a shift in consciousness, if you will, and they become a new way, uh, a new person, if you will. That doesn't mean we let go of the old way because there's a lot of richness and great, great things within obviously the success that they've enjoyed. Uh, but it's helping them uh, blend the two and maximize. Um, and then there's shadow work involved as well that I won't get into. But you know, we all have stuff that we bring along with us in our suitcase, right? So it's 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 identifying those things that aren't serving the client well, and then helping them um, just step into a different experience, as I said earlier. It's very, very exciting. And I want to talk just a little bit more about this topic of practice that you mentioned. And I look at this practice, and by the way, for the audience listening, I am not a golfer. I golf. There's a big difference, right? <laughs> There's. I go out there, I hit that little white ball around, and I tell people I get my money's worth if I pay per stroke because I hit it so many times. <laughs> but there's one thing about it when it comes to practicing you got to have a passion and a desire to improve and so for me and my golf game I have a passion I have a desire to improve so when I go out and practice it's intentional it's conscious I'm making that effort and what I hear you saying is you're going through this practice that this isn't just identifying what you need to change or or you know the frame of reference or mindset that you're coming from but also having this conscious awareness, this intentionality to push yourself forward through practice. Is that what I'm hearing? That, that's a piece of it. And so imagine, even though this is not a, a hierarchy in the truest sense, if you imagine the 12 stages that I've alluded to, I always often uh, give the picture of a mountaintop. You're climbing Mount Everest, right? So if you're in the earlier stages, as we as we refer to them, one is not better than the other. It's just a different worldview or perspective. So if I'm at base camp, I can see what I can see from that level, right? But if I'm climbing that mountain of development, now I'm on a piece, let's say I'm on level five or level six, but you know maybe I get to the top of the, the summit. 
um, I have a different experience. I can see a lot more of the valley below, right? And so that's where the shift occurs as um, you can you can grow horizontally and meaning you can have a very robust life at base camp and be the best that you can be there. That's perfectly awesome, uh, which is where many of us live. But for, for some people, they want more. I just got a, a, a manifesto that one of my friends wrote about uh, for himself this morning. And he's exactly in that place where he's asking all the questions. He wants more than the corporate success. And so what he's really saying is, I want to move to the next level of consciousness. Now, he doesn't know that, but, but that's part of the work that I do is helping them understand what is the tension that you're living in right now. And sometimes to your point of practice and, and the passion and desire to improve and, and the intentionality, those are most of the clients that come to me. They, they, that's how they find their way to me. But often... You know, I have a CEO maybe who will give me someone and say, you know, this is one of my leaders and we're struggling with with their way of, of, of doing business for whatever reason. So they may come to me not necessarily uh, desiring the change, uh, but they're there nonetheless. And that just requires a different level of, of relationship building and trust, which I enjoy and I'm pretty good at. Uh, and then once they buy into it, which is usually by the second session, then we're off and running and, and um you know, they'll, they'll fully engage because it's exciting. We all kind of want to learn about ourselves, right, to some level. And uh, that's, that's where, you know, I've got to be the best that I can be. You know, as a coach, it's, that's part of our job is creating the space for someone to want to fully engage and experience what's next. We all want to know a little bit more about ourselves. And I got to tell you, Sharon, this really resonates with me as a personality test junkie. I love to kind of figure out, you know, how people and quizzes see me and how that ticking goes. And so it's a very fascinating. Now, I wanted to ask you, I'm very interested in the journey that people go on through their lives. And I look at your resume, your bio, and I see this PhD in human and organizational systems. And then you have evolved into this role that you play now. But I want to take you back to that. And, you know, what you had in mind as you were getting your PhD and what the goal was at that point. Well, that's a that's a, a, a interesting question because it's something that I had wanted for a long time. I didn't have the time to do it. I had a son uh, who was born with a physical disability that, you know, took up a lot of time and energy and focus. And um, my son actually passed away in 2008. Uh, and I had applied for the PhD program uh, four years before, got accepted, couldn't get there due to a hurricane in Florida. And then my son became critical and was critical for four years. So I pretty much had given up that dream. Uh, as it turned out, Michael stabilized and I decided to reapply and I was literally pushing the, the send button for the application that I had just completed on Labor Day when I got the call that you know he had to go back in the hospital. So I was accepted, my son passed away and within 17 days, I got the acceptance letter, I think the following March, Michael died in September. And I really wasn't going to do it. I just didn't have, you know, I just wasn't ready at that point. And my husband in his wisdom said, you know, just go to the, the student orientation. It was in Santa Barbara. Uh, it'll be a good trip, even if nothing else. And if you get there and decide you don't want to do it, just drop out. Well, of course, once I got there, I knew this is, you know, what I've been desiring all along. So it wound up being a, an incredible journey. I, I got my PhD in four years. I'd given myself five. Um, it was a very big transformational experience for me, the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. But it also, as it turned out, was perfect timing because it gave me a focus. You know, now I, I was no longer a mother with a, with a sick child. So I had a lot of, you know, who am I? You know, that was a big part of my life. And so it gave me a focus. But it also, because of the way uh, Fielding Graduate University is structured, there was a lot of opportunity for me to grow and heal during those four years. So I, I felt like it got me through the mourning period uh, in a very holistic and nurturing way. And um, it was just awesome. I mean, I just it's just the greatest thing that I've ever done career-wise. You know, we're so sorry to hear about the passing of your son, but the important role that that played in your journey of who you are and all of us as achievers, all of us as goal setters and as business leaders are going to go through struggles. There are going to be obstacles. Hopefully, we don't have to face the same depth of struggles, uh, Sharon, as you had to go through, but they're part of our journey and they're important parts of our journey. And the healing, the growing, the overcoming process that we go through 
makes that journey transformational. And so I appreciate you sharing that with us. Now, I want to shift here. I want to talk about this book because your book title captivates. You talk about time, you talk about money. And one of the first things it talks about in the book is imagine you're at a networking party or a mixer. And we've all been to these and we all wander around and you're listening to these conversations. And it really struck me. It really jumped out to me because you talk about how all the conversations revolve around really these two topics, time and money. Some people, I have plenty of time. I don't have money. Some people have plenty of money. I don't have time. Some people, you know, we're all different variations of that, but all the conversations revolve around it. And it hit me. This is a topic we need to bring to the forefront. We need to talk about. So what's the background of this book? And let's talk a little bit about it. Well, you, I think you, you thank you for such a great synopsis because the book is really, it's not in any way about the management of time and money. Again, it's looking at uh, the conversations that we have, and I'm looking at it through the, 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 the lens of adult development um, because we have different conversations based on where we are developmentally. And, and how it came about for me was, you know, just being in and out of corporate environments and working with so many leaders, you know, I saw that this was, these were the two most vital resources that impact our daily decisions, literally almost moment to moment. And while we talk about it on a superficial level, we often don't have awareness of how our consciousness drives our decision making processes you know, in those moments. So I became very intrigued about it. Um, the story I always share is I had an employee that I could not get to um, create any money at all, even though he was extremely gifted. And I asked the question one day, you know, what is it that you believe about time and money? And his answer astounded me because, or I said, not, not, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. I didn't ask him what he believed about time and money. I asked him what he believed about people who had money. And what he said was they're, they're oppressive, greedy, and egocentric. And it was in that moment, Jake, that I realized, well, if he believes that, no wonder I can't get him to make any money because why would he want to be like those guys? And so that kind of was the eye opener for me. And I began to just pay attention uh, to what was going on around me and realizing that this is a conversation I wanted to stir up. But more importantly, part of my coaching work allows uh, us to dive into the meaning making systems around these two resources. And, and really the premise of the book is... Again, not so much about the management of, but the, the thought patterns around these two constructs and how are they impacting your relationships? Because ultimately, that's what it boils down to is where am I investing my time and money? You know, we have we have the old adage where your heart where your heart is there's you know where your treasure is there's your heart and vice versa. And so, you know, am I willing to invest uh, time and money in the people around me, or 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 am I not? And I think it's becoming I'm, I'm really noticing kind of this phenomenon. I almost wrote a blog about it the other day, and I probably will in a week or so. Everywhere I go, I'm seeing parents sitting in restaurants or wherever with small children. And it broke my heart uh, a week ago. I was in a breakfast meeting, and for an hour and a half, I watched this young, handsome, well-meaning father who had his young son with him out to breakfast. And the whole time, I couldn't help but notice he was on his phone. And the little boy was just sitting there kind of playing with his food and quietly entertaining himself. And I thought, wow, you know, you are going to be very surprised if this is what you're living every day when this young man is 15 years old and you're wondering why he doesn't make time to listen to you. And I think we're up against this time money thing in ways now around technology that we're only beginning to understand and explore. It's exciting to have all, all this access, but Again, you know, where are we investing time and money in terms of our relationships? And that's internally in, in our corporate environments, because I see a lot of CEOs who live on the scarcity perspective, uh, as well as is in our personal lives. So one of the things that we're offering on the website, uh, the timemoneybook.com, is an instrument that I've been uh, working on and, and we've developed over the last three years that helps people see where they fall on the spectrum between scarcity and abundance. Uh, so that they can begin the conversation and start to explore where changes might need to be made. And changes can only be made when there's an understanding about what's going on in your life with time and money. And we recently had a guest on the podcast, R Rabbi Daniel Lappin, who wrote the book, The Ten Commandments of Making Money, uh, Thou Shall Prosper. And one of his Ten Commandments, about 30 pages, covers this 
idea of is making money bad? Is having wealth bad? And there's this mentality that's out there, and it's not in all of us. And a lot of times it's not in higher achievers, but in some of us, we have this idea that making money is somehow immoral or is wrong. And so that understanding of how we understand money and how it plays into our lives can be very important as we move forward. Where are we investing our time and our money? And so one of the quotes that you have in your book that really jumped out to me, it said, what if it turned out that everything you believed about time and money was keeping you from achieving a meaningful, prosperous life? And then it goes on to really define what a prosperous life is. And so I wanted to throw that to you. What if everything we believed about time and money is keeping us from prosperity? How do we answer that? Well, I think it's, it's again, I'm wanting to open the conversation. And part of the reason is because, again, from a developmental perspective, what we do know based on research is that people in the earlier stages, even in those successful elements of uh, the expert uh, achiever stages that I mentioned a moment ago, um, often don't have the ability, we know that they don't have the ability to, and particularly in the stage before, let me go back for a minute to the opportunist stage which is imagine it almost like an adolescent stage, although you can be 40, 50 years old because this is not necessarily correlated to age, although it can be. But they do not often have the ability to think in forward ways. They're often thinking in the past or only living in the present. So even to imagine uh, my time or money a year out or three months out or six months out is a big challenge for people who are, are in those earlier stages. So what I want people to understand first and foremost is, you know, what are your paradigms around time and money? Because prosperity is a place to come from, not a place to get to. It's a mindset. So, you know, we know that there, there are indigenous cultures that live in the Himalayan mountains or in such places that have very peaceful, abundant lives, and they feel that they have enough, you know. Um, and, and so, what, what does that mean? Their, their sense of abundance is not necessarily what Westernized society is like. I remember being down in Costa Rica and being somewhat overcome initially in the village that I was in by the poverty that was there. But the longer I stayed there, the more I realized these are really happy people who fish every day and they have wonderful, meaningful, prosperous lives with their family within this culture. But I was measuring it by my standard because, you know, they, they weren't living in, in mansions with, uh, you know, nice cars in the driveway. That's what in Western society we think prosperity is. What I'm saying is it can be a lot of things. There's nothing wrong with having wealth and abundance in the typical Westernized sense. But what are you doing as an individual with your time and money and how is it serving you in the greater good or the people that you love? Because I think it's different for every one of us. There's no right or wrong way. But there is also this, this momentum in Western culture of I need more, 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 more. And we know there's a lot of emptiness in that conversation and that more of us are feeling chased by the clock. And we feel like no matter how much I make, the house isn't big enough. I don't have enough cars. So um, certainly I've lived that. And, and um, I'm wanting more out of life now. And so I think there are many of us in that place that are examining our belief systems around time and money. And for me, at this point in my life, it's more about what I call the cycle of freedom, which has to do with stewardship of your resources, which I believe leads to greater compassion and opportunities for more generosity and gratitude and ultimately more, self, uh, more love for yourself and others. I want to talk a little bit about this living the chase that you mentioned, but before I do, I want to make sure that the audience caught that prosperity is a mindset. And in some of the Western societies, this prosperity has become a destination. It's not a journey. And I got to echo what you were saying, Sharon. I've lived for a while in the Philippines. I've been there nine times. And I've got to tell you, the Filipino people are some of the poorest financially well-off people that you'll ever meet. But the happiest group of people. We have loved our time spending with them. And it's not about how many dollars are in the bank. It's about living a prosperous life day to day. And so I just want to echo what you were saying there. Now I want to circle back and, and that last point that you made was living the chase, that constant pursuit of not having enough. And it's interesting you brought it up because I had made a note previously from your book to make sure I talked about this with you. Because in your book, you say, Living the chase is not B 
being or not having enough. And as I read that, it jumped out to me that living the chase has really got two elements to it. It's got this not being enough and this on the flip side, not having enough. And I wanted you to break that down a little bit for us. These really these two things, living the chase of not having and not being enough. Well, I think the not being enough um, to me is is what we see a lot again in westernized culture where where we we are chasing the dollars and feeling chased by the clock because we need all the bows and whistles and the toys to prove that we are enough. You know, I mean, I think it's easy to fall into that trap. I know I certainly did. You know, I came from a very, very poor family and, and I didn't know we were poor because we were happy, as you, as you just alluded to, with the, with the people in the Philippines. But I certainly went through that period in my life where it was all about acquisition. You know, I've had the big, the big house and all the cars. I had horses. I had trailers. I, I mean, you name it. Um, my, my husband and I have had been very, very blessed for two kids from East L.A. Uh, but there was a point when I realized, you know, that the, I don't own the stuff anymore. The stuff owns me. And as I did the work, the, the transformational work, you know, then I began to see that it's not about what I have. It's about who I am. And so I, I think there's an opportunity in that process of growth to examine, again, what really matters to me. And I still have, I have a nice house and I drive a nice car and all that, but I I don't have a need for any of that. And I know a lot of people who are in that place where they have had the success, they've had the wealth, but now they're looking to, how do I let go of some of this and how do I use the resources that I have perhaps in a generous way that will benefit those who may have less than. And I mean, there's, again, a lot of different ways that people are, are, are reaching um, whatever that, that means for them in terms of generosity. But one of the things I talk about in the book is narcissistic generosity, because what we saw when we did the research on the time money inventory that I mentioned that's on the website, um, again, confidential and, and pro bono for anyone who wants to access it and you get a free report was the spectrum of scarcity was fairly obvious. The spectrum of abundance was fairly obvious. Where it got real tricky was in the middle where you had moderate scarcity and moderate abundance. And by that, I mean, we saw that people in the moderate scarcity uh, category often found themselves to be responsible. They were doing all the right things. So they were engaged in the chase. They were earning the money. They were saving the money for later in life and retirement and kids college and had the house and the car and they're doing all those things, but they were making fear-based decisions. I'm getting ready to do a deeper round of of, um, research in the next uh, or the last quarter of the year to explore this further. But the preliminary research shows that scarcity is about having fear. So for instance, one of the examples that I often use is A guy that I came across who was doing all the right things, as I just mentioned, but couldn't or would not even take his family on vacation or to Disney World because we can't afford it because we're saving, you know. So there's a scarcity in there. I so admire what you've done with your family and and your travels because um, that to me is a very abundant approach to life of I'm going to do something that is is creating memories for my family and and we're we're throwing it all in and we're going to go out and experience the world for a year. Uh, that's a, that to me is a very high level thinking process in terms of how I value time and money. Because what it says to me is here's a guy who's, who's successful, who knows who he is such that he's going to invest in his family and at least create uh, this amazing experience for one year. That's that to me takes a lot of courage and a lot of discipline. And it's also, as I said a moment ago, a very, in my mind, a very, high perspective coming from abundance. And it can't be replicated artificially. It's something that needs to be done at the time and place that it can be done. And I'm not suggesting to everybody out there that they go and quit their job or retire and go on the road, take their family for a year. But for our family, as we looked at prosperity, and I'm referring, Sharon, to the prosperity that you mentioned, that's the mindset and this living in abundance, for us, it was an opportunity to go out and show our kids experiences that they couldn't have as they got up and went to school every day in the community that we were living. And as I listened to what you talked about there, as I talked about this not being enough, one of the things that really triggered to me is when we have these feelings of not being enough, when we're worried that we're not enough, part of the 
reason that we have those thoughts, part of the reason that we experience that is because we're turned too much in on ourselves. It's a more selfish way of thinking. And as we focus so much on ourselves and what we have and what we're able to do, comparing ourselves to those around us, well, then we start to feel like we don't have enough and that we need to have more. But what I hear you saying is that if we get outside of ourselves, if we if we learn to serve and share and add value to other people, to lift other people up, well, then we start to realize how benefited we've been and how blessed that we've been in our lives. And I hope that I sum that up. Is that what you were saying? I think you summed it up beautifully. And what you brought to mind uh, about your own family, it, you know, I think that's a very pointed uh, discussion that can go in a lot of different directions because it is up to every individual and every family. And what you reminded me of was the time many years ago uh, when my son was in middle school, my husband was in transition uh, in his own business and we had a lull there in between. And it wasn't the best time financially for us to go on the road, quote, on the road. Uh, but we made a decision to, to uh, go from San Francisco uh, traveling six weeks across the United States. I, I was actually homeschooling my son at that time. And my and I remember saying to my husband, I don't think this is the best time for us financially to do this. And he said, Sharon, he's never going to be this age again. And I'm never going to be, I'm never going to have this amount of time again. We have to just do it. And we did this thing across country, across the United States in a van with my son in the wheelchair and his, his canine companion. And I'm going to tell you, I don't think we even knew then that that would turn out to be the memories that we, I mean, my son talked about that all through his illness. He was in this state, he was in Chicago, he was here, he was there in his, in his delirium. And we look back on that and we say, thank God we did that. Was, that, was it the most practical thing? I think probably many of our friends thought we were insane, um, but we somehow intuitively knew this is what we need to do for our family and we'll create the rest when we get back. <laughs> Cause I think that's a part of abundance that entrepreneurs often know that maybe others uh, may, may not know as readily is it's about creating. There's a, there's a creative element to abundance that really requires that you know you're enough and that you can get back to where you need to go. And even beyond that um, by that creativeness that lives within experiences give us opportunities to grow. They give us opportunities to transform. And one of the things that I, I think resonates in this conversation, and that is you've got a lot of life left to make back those pennies and dollars that these experiences are costing you, but you don't have a lot of life left to have an experience. I told you that my son, he's five years old. He has been in 12 countries and he is having a ball. One of his favorite things to say when we were in Thailand, he used to say, Dad, I'm more famous than Facebook. Of course, he doesn't know what Facebook is, but he just knows that he's on Facebook because we're having these experiences and, and people are noticing him and he kind of stands out of the crowd as, as we're in these foreign countries. And that is something that we will laugh about and chuckle about for our whole lives, the experiences that give us opportunities to grow and transform. Sharon, I really appreciate the time that we've had and I see that our time is running a little bit near the end here. Before I let you go, I'd love to get to know you just a little bit better in a section we call Learning from Leaders, a few rapid fire questions where we get to learn about you. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah, it sounds fun. Let's do it. Wonderful. How about the book currently on your Kindle or bedside table? Well, I have a whole iPad full of books because I'm usually reading six or seven at a time depending on my mood. But I would say one of my most recent favorite over the last few years is Essentialism by Greg McEwen. It really changed my life, um, and I just recommend that highly to everyone. And that book is an absolute must-read. I saw Greg speak in San Jose a couple of years back, and I was mesmerized by his topic, and then I rent, went and read his book. I've now read it a couple of times. I couldn't agree more. A terrific book, Essentialism by Greg McEwen. How about best movie ever made? So many, because I'm also a movie buff, but I would say my maybe my top two off the top of my head, Gone with the Wind, of course, a classic, and I loved The Sting and Age of Innocence. Such different genres of movies. Interesting. I'm in a lot of genres, both in my reading and in my movie going, yeah. How about your leadership superpower? I think it's my discipline and my self-care, particularly in the areas of those six developmental lines that I mentioned. I'm very, I'm very intentional on how I take care of myself so that my brain is at the best 
optimal level possible. Intentional self-care. I really love that. How about a motivational quote, philosophy, or mantra? Well, I think for now, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I have many that I live by, but for now, for me, in, in this moment with the book, is what I gave you earlier, prosperity is not a place to come from, it's a, or a place to get to, rather, it's a place to come from. And I can say that about a lot of things, you know, abundance, I can say it about leadership. I mean, um, it's about the journey, as far as I'm concerned, and, and just really being the best that you can be along the way, and, and not so much see these, these um, things as a destination, as you well so put it, but as a process. Yeah, one of the saddest things is to get to the finish line and realize you missed the race. If you could leave just one leadership trait to your kids or the next generation, what would it be? Um, passion, also in um, and purpose, because I don't think you have. I think purpose is where the passion comes from. Hey, can we call those the two P's of prosperity: passion and purpose? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I like that. All right. That's ours. Nobody else can use it. Yeah. Well, Sharon, I cannot thank you enough for coming on the show, imparting your wisdom. Absolutely fascinating topic, time and money, starting this conversation, creating a new paradigm of discussion about time and money. Before we let you go today, can you offer us any last bit of advice and then tell us where can we find out more about you and pick up a copy of the book? Well, I hope that your listeners will just lean into the conversation around their own experiences of time and money, and they can get the book at thetimemoneybook.com forward slash ML for modern leadership, of course. And um, I just invite them to get in there and see all the, the great resources that we have. One is the time money inventory that I mentioned. The other is I wrote a manifesto on radical abundance, which is a PDF they can download. And certainly I'm available for any questions or if anyone wants a, a consult to kind of discuss this further, we can make that happen as well. And that can happen through SharonSpano.com. Wonderful. We'll link all of those up on the show notes for this episode. Again, Sharon, can't thank you enough. I know your time is so valuable. Thanks for sharing it with us. Have a great day. Same to you, Jake. And thanks again for having me. It was really enjoyable. Again, another huge thanks to Dr. Sharon Spano for coming on the Modern Leadership Podcast and talking about such a fascinating topic. You know, as I thought back, as I was reading this in the book and I was thinking about my own life and my own networking experiences, I realized that almost every conversation truly does revolve around this time and money. And it's either somebody complaining that they don't have enough of one or they have too much of the other. And the idea is, let's start this conversation, get people to understand that prosperity isn't a destination, it's a journey. How can we live our lives in such a way that we enjoy these rich experiences that we have, that we create memories, that we build relationships? As we talked about that not being enough, that feeling of not being enough, the thing that jumped out to me is those who feel like they aren't enough often are too focused on themselves. They're too internally focused and they don't share, serve, and spread the word and help around to those outside of them. As we get too caught up within ourselves, as we start to forget about other people, then we become selfish and we start to question our abilities. We start to question our worth. We start to question our value. But as we share and spread the word, as we serve as we go out there and do the best we can with those around us, well, then we start to realize how blessed we are and how much abundance exists in our world and in our lives. So a terrific conversation with Dr. Sharon Spano. Can't thank her enough for coming on the show. If you would like to get any of the information from this show, including all the links that we talked about, pick up a copy of Sharon's book, read some of the quotes that we talked about, all of that can be found over on jakeacarlson.com slash ML32 for Modern Leadership Episode 32, ML32. And until next week, I want to wish you the best of days, an even better life, and stay awesome. Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there.